life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. All together worthy. On the overhead, you can see what we're going to be talking about today. And, you know, most of us just kind of take it with a grain of salt. We've heard it forever and a day. We see it on our, on our money and different places. And so we've just come to accept it. But I don't think that we really truly understand the full dynamic of what it means. Turn with me, if you would, into 2 Timothy. And in 2 Timothy, we're going to go to the second chapter. And uh, notice what's found in verse 11. It is a trustworthy statement, Paul writes. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So basically what's going on there is Paul writing to Timothy and talking about how God is trustworthy. Trustworthy. We, we go to buy a car. Go to buy a house. We fill out the various paperwork. They do a credit check on us. Credit check is to determine whether or not we are trustworthy. And then what they'll do is they'll say, well, we're going to give them a chance. And uh, they'll give a certain rate of interest predicated on kind of on how trustworthy we may appear on paper. Trustworthy. So how trustworthy are you? I mentioned in class this morning, last time Linda and I bought cars, we had a 0% interest. So what that told me, that company felt that we were really trustworthy. So how do we look at God? Is God trustworthy? Now, to be honest with you, I was surprised when they said that. Because there were times when life was hard and we got laid on bills every once in a while. And so our credit rating went down accordingly. But you build it back up again. But have we ever looked at God as not being worthy of our trust? Trustworthy means assurance, reliance on the character ability, and strength in truth. The dependability of someone. Worthy of confidence. Various synonyms you can see on the overhead. Safe, reliable, responsible. And the last one, true. Trustworthy. So we look at that. We appreciate it. So yeah, in God we trust. Back in the book of Psalms, the 118th Psalm, verse 8, David writes, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in men. And see, I think that's what's happened. I think that we have taken trust in men. We've forgotten how truly trustworthy God is. Because you look around at us and you go, we've changed. As a nation, we've changed. But then we look in a little bit more micro setting. And we look at our people, our friends. We haven't changed. So how in a macro sense has society changed? And I've told you before, I'm neither Republican nor am I Democrat. I'm not even a libertarian, not a member of the Peace and Freedom Party, not a member of Socialists for America. 
I'm not a member of any political party. And even as we talk today, because this will be a definitely a two-part lesson, it is not about politics. And even though we're going into a political season in 24, it's not what this is about. It's about the fact that we may be, as a nation, being judged by God. I don't know. I don't know. But it's possible, and we'll show you some evidence of things in the past. But I think the clarion call needs to go out that need, we need to get back on track, spiritual track. After Lincoln had given the Gettysburg Address, which coincidentally, the school I went to when I was in fourth grade, we had to learn, we said the Pledge of Allegiance, we said the Gettysburg Address, we said the preamble to the Constitution, all before we could start class. We memorized it, four score, seven years ago. That had to be memorized. We, the people of the United States, had to be memorized. I don't think kids do that in school anymore. But as any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. He was asking a question. He was going back to the foundation of the nation and asking very, a very specific question. Can we endure if we get away from the tried and true? People will argue that the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, has no references to God whatsoever. The Declaration of Independence has four direct references to God. Now, I'm not going to take time to go into them all. But suffice to say, there are four. And they're rather striking. In 1861, Treasury Secretary Chase, Salmon Chase to be exact, declared in a letter. I'm going to quote from that letter. No nation can be strong except in the strength of God or safe except in his defense. The trust of our people should be declared on our national coins. So it started out by based on that, that the two-cent piece had stamped on it in God we trust. And it was the 84th Congress that finally passed law, legislation, that the motto of the United States of America is in God we trust. So I want you to stand back and I want you to think just for a moment, do you really believe that that is the case with us? That we truly trust in God as a people? You may as an individual. We trust in God. We're gathered together on the first day of the week. We're manifesting our trust in God. But walk outside. What do you see? How does it stack up with the people? It's evident that people today want to rewrite the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. They want to do away with so many things. And I sit back and I, I look at us as a nation of 350-ish million people. And I look at the people that are in office and I go, how can that be? Is this the best that we have? And I'm not railing on anybody. But is this the best we can do? And if we had trust in God, I think we could do a whole lot better. Now, I'm talking again about a collective. 
a collective. But we're not the only ones that have gone down this road. If you go back into the book of Jonah, and you read what Jonah is really all about, it's about an individual who I think was a patriot. He was told by God to go and warn the people of Nineveh that unless they repent, they're going to be destroyed. Now, here's where the patriot part comes. Jonah goes, I loathe the Assyrians. I know what they're going to do. They're going to come in. They're going to destroy Israel. But if I don't go warn them, God will destroy the Assyrians. And so that's what was going through his head. He gets on the ship. He's going the opposite way of the way he was supposed to. And then it comes about the storm. And he begs them. He says, throw me over. I'm the reason. God's, God's upset with me. So chuck me over. Okay. Out into the briny deep. The great fish was commissioned. Swallowed him up. Threw him up on dry land days later. Only then did Jonah realize it's what God really wants me to do. And grudgingly, he went and told the people of Nineveh, God has judged you and found you wanting. He's given you a chance to repent. Turn to him. And the people of Nineveh did for a while. Oh, Jonah was not happy. Because he was willing to surrender himself in order to, from his twisted way of thinking, try to save Israel by going against God. He thought he was doing the right thing. In Daniel, the fourth chapter, Nebuchadnezzar was proud and arrogant. Daniel came to him with a message from God. Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to be relegated to the field. You're going to be out there for an extended period of time. You're going to become like an animal until you come to your senses and realize that God is in control. You have to put your trust in God. Acknowledge him. And Nebuchadnezzar, easy for me to say, Nebuchadnezzar didn't repent right away. He was relegated out to the field. He was brought low. He was out there for a period of time. His fingernails became like talons. His hair, like eagle feathers. So an eagle feather is 12 to 14 inches long. So if hair grows roughly half to three quarters of an inch a month, tells you he was out there 18 months-ish, year-ish to 18 months. Finally, he comes to his senses. He comes back and recognizes God. What's my point? My point on both of these is that God was in a position of judging them and giving them a chance. Now, I know throughout the Bible, God is judged on a limited basis, various nations. I know that. And I, again, I don't know that we're under judgment by God. But you look around and you see what's happening. And you sit back and wonder, how could God not be judging us? Turn in the book of Daniel over to the um, ninth chapter. By this time, the, the nation of Judah, Israel and Judah had separated. Israel, part that Jonah was dealing with, was eventually carried away by the Assyrians. Judah was left, and Judah was ultimately carried away into captivity by the Babylonians. They were told you're going to be there 70 years. So Daniel, in captivity in Babylon, he's praying, and he's acknowledging the sins. The sins. And what I think we need to take away 
from what Daniel's doing here is whether or not we're being honest and what we're trying to do about it. So I want you to drop down with me. It starts in verse 3. Uh, Daniel gives attention to God. In other words, he's really thinking about where they are and his part in it all. And he begins to pray. In verse uh, 5, we have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, rebelled, even turning aside from thy commandments and ordinances. Verse 6, moreover, we have not listened to thy servants, the prophets, who spoke in thy name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of Israel goes on down. Verse 8, we have sinned against thee. Verse 10, uh, verse 9, to the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him, nor have we obeyed his voice, our God, to walk in his teachings, which he said before us through his servants, the prophets. Now, did you notice, excuse me, the use of the pronoun we Daniel was viewed as a righteous man. But Daniel said, this is what we as a people have done. This is why we're in the position we're in. Dear God, I pray, I pray for you to look with kindness on us. We need to repent. We need to do. He was praying on behalf of the people. Do we pray? on behalf of our nation? Do we pray on behalf of our leaders? Do we really sit back and, and are mindful of the degradation we've gone to? And again, like I said, I'm not jumping on either side. I simply look and I'm, I'm aghast because I know there's something that we can do. I know there are things that, that we must be doing. And I know it from a, from a standpoint of spirituality that begins to spill over into those things of a municipality. Our bulletin is called the Bulwarks. And I called it that for a specific reason. Because of what's seen back in Psalms 48. Walk about Zion. Go around her, count her towers, consider her ramparts, another word for bulwarks. Go through her palaces that you may tell it to the next generation. See, we have a responsibility to the generation coming up in the church to get them grounded and rooted. We have a responsibility to those in society to see to it that they are grounded and rooted as well. In Psalms 11 and verse 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The foundation. What is the very foundation of our nation? Foundationally, it's home and family. What's the foundation of the church? For no man can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, is what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3.11. We know the foundations. And the foundations go to the level of trust. You remember where you were on um, in 1994? January 17th at roughly 4.31 in the morning. You remember where you were? How sure was the foundation? How sure was it? We lived on a raised foundation. Below us was, below us was a basement. And the foundation was on two by fours, four by fours that were built up to go under the floor joists. 
When that hit, it threw us completely out of bed. Everything came up and threw us out into the hallway or onto the other side. Everything in the house was lifted up, slammed down. Cleanup was with the shovel. Foundation wasn't too short. All the walls were cracked. The church building, I'm talking about Lassen Street. The church building, which, two story. But the beams had gone, egg, and you looked at it, and the whole building was tilted to the west. Our house came back down right where it should have been. But the foundation, it wasn't really that sure. But the foundation down at the church building was absolutely sure. There were no cracks, no fissures in the foundation. After two days, the building snapped right back into place. The red tag was pulled down. Sure foundation. How sure is our foundation? Spiritually, it's got to be Christ. But what about society? What's our foundation like? Because as I said, the foundation of society, any society, is the home. And whoever wants to bring about a market change in our country is going to do it in the home and through education. Those two ways. It, it's in strict harmony with Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky. You get to them to do this, you get them to do that. It's going to take some time, but after it starts, it begins to accelerate. I was surprised as I began thinking about this lesson because somebody had asked me to preach a lesson like this. And I said, yeah, I really don't know. So I started checking, just looking at the two things I mentioned. Those that believe in Christianity, and I paint with a broad brush, with that word. In the United States, it fell from 78% who believed in it, who adhered to it, who made passing reference to it. 78% of the population in 21 said they agreed with it. Excuse me, in 2007. When the next poll was taken on it in 21, it was 63%. Now you realize how big of a drop that is? And in that short of a period of time, 14 years ish. What's my mathematics like? Yeah, somewhere around there. Short period of time from 2007 to 2021. Those who identified with having no religion grew from 16% to 29%, nearly doubled. Nearly doubled. 40% of Americans think that conventional marriage is outdated. The divorce rate, you've heard it said 50% of all marriages end in divorce. That's not correct. That's not correct. According to the Forbes advisor, from August 8th of this year, 44.2% of first marriages end in divorce. 67% of second marriages end in divorce. 73% of third marriages end in divorce. Malachi 3 verse 16, God hates divorce. If we really trust in God, we're going to be mindful of when we enter into marriage. Truly mindful. Truly mindful. 
15.7 million children live in a home without a father present. That's in a recent study. It's scary. It's frightening. So if the home and family is impacted, do you realize what that's going to do to the foundation of everything? I mean, it's mind-numbing. So, how did you fare back on January 17th, 1994? What was your foundation like? What was the house like? Did you do something about the foundation? Did you try to strengthen it? Fill in the cracks? Be out of concrete slab? Some people dug up their foundation. Put in a whole new one. Foundation of this country, of any country, is the home. Go back to Matthew, 19th chapter, verse 7. Actually, let's go to 4. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, two shall become one flesh. Consequently, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. It's the foundation. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's what Joshua said. Choose for yourself today who you are going to serve. So if our nation's motto, in God we trust, then we need to trust God from the foundation of our home and family and move forward. I preached a sermon called The Seas of Marriage, The Seven Seas of Marriage. And I thought I was going to preach it before the end of the year, but no. So Lord willing, I'll preach it sometime shortly. Because again, it strengthens the foundation. And that's what we want. But if our homes, if our homes, if our families are being destroyed, if the concept of marriage is being destroyed, then what do we have left? Where can we turn? We as a nation accept deviations from marriage at every juncture. Totally, totally. 40% saying traditional marriage is gone. And you realize if it's 40% today, there's nothing holding it back, nothing pushing back against it unless it's us on an individual basis. It's amazing what the power of one can do. One. One. And then if you've got one, you got two. You got two, you can get three. And you can begin to push back. Because what we're seeing happening now in society with regards to marriage did not start with a majority. It started with a minority. Few in number who had an agenda. So what do we see going on? We sat aghast when same-sex marriage was agreed. I was driving from Red, uh, excuse me, from Madras, Oregon. I was going to... Um, Moscow, Idaho, to hold a meeting. I was driving in the car. It was a great day, early May. I just stopped at Sonic. Hadn't been to a Sonic burger in a while. All right. So I got the fries. I got the drinks. I'm ready to go. 100 miles of empty land. Radio's on. And then the word came what the Supreme Court 
decided to do. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. They changed it. That was major. But then what's happened since then is polyamorous marriages are accepted. Just don't file the paperwork. And polyamorous is many people involved in a marriage. Three, four, five, any variation therein. It's accepted. The LBG Q plus agenda has been accepted. But see, marriage belongs to God. And what God made in the beginning is what it remains. People may be calling different things marriage, but it's not. And it is eating away at the fiber of our nation. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and verse 22 and following, when Paul was trying to explain the relationship between man and woman and Christ and the church, looks exactly what he used. Here's the way it's supposed to be. Christ is the head of the church as man is and so on. No deviation, no variation. Sixth chapter, he talks about parents' responsibility to kids. We're to train them. We're to teach them. Yeah, they're going to drive us crazy. They're going to make us, in my case, I'm gone bald because I had three sons. I've got white hair because I had three sons. It's all blamed on them. I have an extra pound or two. Because I had three sons. Children are challenging. And I told Linda before we were married. And we were planning the wedding. I said, you know, I know. If we have kids. They're going to drive me to distraction. And if they don't, I would think there was something wrong with them. God created us. God put in place the law of, of uh, perpetuation of the gen- of generation of people. Do you not think that the way we are, are impacts God? Brings sorrow to him? We're doing that to God. Think how we feel when our children challenge us. And we're challenging God all the time. It ought not to be this way. Yet, it's accepted in society. Fisher in the the foundation. And yet we say, in God we trust. And those in the religious world that want to make that assertion, it's clearly, it's clearly not true. If we trusted God, we would take him at his word. Well, our time's up. We'll come back, talk more about it this afternoon. We're going to talk about it from a different perspective. We're going to talk about it from the other foundation of society. Children, education. And we'll begin looking at all those things. And we'll talk about them this afternoon and talk more about whether or not we trust in God. And I think we just wink at a lot of things. And our society needs to get back to the foundation. In God we trust. Well, the lesson is yours this morning. It was not a lesson that was designed to show the gospel plan. But it did show, I hope, that God has a plan. And he put that plan into motion. And the plan centers in and around his son. In Ephesians first chapter, verse 10. The summing up of all things in Christ. Things in the heaven, things on the earth. Colossians 3.18. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of our Lord and Savior, 
Jesus Christ. He is the authority in all things. We look to his word. We pattern our life after his word. And when this nation was founded, they wanted to do so according to what God put in place. You realize that? They talk about it in the Declaration of Independence four different times. Four. It's in the Mayflower Compact. It's everywhere. But sadly, men are trying to get it out because they don't like the motto, in God we trust. Well, if you're here and not a child of God, we'd like nothing more than for you to place your trust in God. We'll be glad to sit down and study with you to show you exactly, book, chapter, and verse, what it would take for you to become a child of God. But maybe you already know what you need to do. That you realize you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. To emerge to walk in newness of life. We'll be glad to assist you. Or maybe you've already done that, but you need your, the prayers of the congregation for strength and or encouragement. However we can be of a spiritual service, we invite you to come while we stand and sing. Oh.